Welcome back to 50 Fundamental Chain Reaction Mechanisms. This is episode 4 in the series, and we'll be covering advanced connects techniques. But if you haven't seen the previous episodes, I recommend that you catch up. You can click right here to watch them. And we're going to dive right back into the list with number 31, falling support. This mechanism is where you have a support underneath the heavier side of a tilting object, and when some weight is applied to the lighter side, the heavier side lifts up slightly, allowing the support to fall away. Here's where it gets a little bit confusing though, because even though we've added some weight to the lighter side, it's still the lighter side, except now there's no support underneath the heavier side, which means the heavier side will go down. So if you're keeping track here, what that really means is that we're adding weight to one side to make it go up. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at a classic example of how to use a falling support with this automatic ball lift, meaning that the weight of the ball itself is what causes the ball lift to move. No other connections needed. This looks deceptively simple, but there's actually kind of a lot going on here. Let's walk through this step by step. At the very beginning, we can see that the right side of the ball lift is heavier. You can see the weight there. And it wants to go downwards, but it can't because the support is holding it up. As for the falling support, it's weighted in such a way, thanks to this white piece at the bottom here, that it wants to fall to the side, except the weight from the heavier side of the ball lift provides enough resistance to hold it in place. But everything changes when the ball enters the lighter side of the ball lift, because now there's not quite as much force pressing downwards on the falling support, allowing it to fall to the side. But counterintuitively, even though the left side of the ball lift tips down ever so slightly with the weight of the ball, the right side is still heavier, which means without any support holding it in place, that side is free to rotate downwards, lifting the ball. Another way to think about it is if we removed the falling aspect from falling support and just put a stable support underneath the heavier side. What we'd see is the ball enters the ball lift, the ball lift soaks up that impact slightly, and then falls back onto the support. And I know this all sounds really specific, like you have to be very careful to calibrate all the weights very precisely in order to get this to work, but if you build it yourself, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that it's actually fairly easy to get this to work. The falling support is a fantastic mechanism for making automatic ball lifts like we've seen, but it's also a great mechanism to have in your back pocket for any kind of tilting trick, like say an auto tilt. Because the falling support is so heavily reliant on weight distribution, you can get really creative with how you calibrate the weights, and you can use that to your advantage to accomplish some really interesting motions. For example, you can have a falling support that doesn't fall with a light weight, but then does fall later with a heavier weight. The next mechanism on the list is almost identical to the falling support, except for one key difference. It's kind of an inverted version. Allow me to introduce you to the falling latch. While the falling support is a support underneath the heavier side of a tilting object to hold it up, the falling latch is a latch on top of the lighter side of an object to hold it down. But their functions are identical. They are used for the exact same purpose. So we're going to take a look at the falling latch in the same context as we did before with the ball lift. You can see that there's virtually no difference between the motions that are happening here. When the ball enters the ball lift, it soaks up the impact slightly to allow the latch to fall to the side, and then the ball lift returns to its natural resting point by lifting the ball. And here's what the falling latch would look like if we used it in that same auto tilt example. And just to really drive the point home about how similar the falling support and the falling latch are, let's take a look at that ball lift example again using both of them. No, this is not superimposed footage. That's just what it looks like. So which one do I recommend? Well, it all depends on context, right? I mean, they go on different sides of a tilting object, so the biggest determining factor might just be which side you have more space to build on. Number 33, disconnecting lever. A disconnecting lever is a lever with a weight at the end that's used to lift or tilt an object. But after a certain point, the lever rotates past the object, or disconnects, allowing you to then lower or tilt the object back in the other direction without having to overcome the weight on the lever. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at that same auto tilt example that uses the falling support. As we've seen, the auto tilt works just fine with a ping pong ball, but what happens if we try it with a billiard ball? Well, 
the track tilts and the support does fall, but the ball's just too heavy. Well, as we've discussed, one very crucial element of the falling support is that the side with the support on it still actually does have to be heavier. So let's try adding some weight over there. And not quite. The ball's not heavy enough to lift the track at all, so the support doesn't even fall. It seems like what we need, almost, is a way to help the ball tilt the track when it rolls to the left, but then not interfere at all when the track tilts and the ball rolls to the right. Well, that is the job of the disconnecting lever. And here's what it looks like in action. It does go very fast, but hopefully you can tell that what happens here is that the weights on the lever help to lift the track up, but after the track reaches a certain height, the lever disengages and falls away from the track, allowing the track to then be lowered without having to reverse that whole process and lift the weights back up again. Here's an example of a sorting system doing pretty much exactly what you might expect. A lighter ball rolls across the track and isn't heavy enough to tilt it, but then a heavier ball rolls across the track and is heavy enough to tilt it. But the disconnecting lever allows you to subvert these expectations and do something a little bit different, where the lighter ball actually gets redirected to the lower path and the heavier ball stays on top. Number 34, compression rod release. A compression rod release is when an object that wants to move in a certain direction is held in place by a rod under compression force. In other words, the rod is almost directly in line with the path of motion that the object wants to take. So I'll show you what I mean in just a second, but let's build up to it so I can show you some of the problems that this mechanism is designed to solve. Here we have a track mounted on some sliders and an elastic band that's pulling the track to the right side. And the challenge here is what kind of release mechanism can we create that will hold the track in place on the left? In this first attempt, we're using just a standard connects lever, but there are several problems with this. The first is that the connects lever is actually pretty terrible at holding back force from the side like this. And you can see here that both the track and the lever itself are skewing to the right. The second problem is that if we're holding the track in this first position, there's a good chance we probably want to roll a ball across it. And the placement of this lever is unfortunate because it doesn't allow us to place another track here. Finally, the elastic band is very strong, so it's applying a lot of force onto this lever. And the fact of the matter is, this lever structure simply isn't that secure that high up. There's nothing there to reinforce it. So we're asking the hot glue in this case to do a lot of work and hold up under a lot of stress. And eventually, it's just gonna give up. So what if we try a different technique? Another one that we've talked about before, the Connex Rod Lock. As I mentioned, one of the strengths of the Connex Rod Lock is its ability to hold back large amounts of force, and that's the case here too. You can see that the problem that we were having where the track would skew to the right is fixed now. And because the Connex Rod Lock is positioned underneath the structure, it won't interfere with any tracks that we might need to put around the structure. Unfortunately, we now have a new, although pretty minor problem, where the domino isn't actually strong enough to pull the Connex rod lock like it could the Connex lever. And we still have the problem where we're asking the hot glue to hold up under a lot of force. So, I mean, yes, we could increase the weight that's pulling on the end of the string, and we could super glue the Connex rod lock in place, but Ideally, we can find a release mechanism that solves all four of those problems. A solution that doesn't flex, doesn't interfere with the path of the ball, can be released easily with just the weight of the domino, and doesn't put a lot of strain on the hot glue, or whatever other adhesive that we're using. So let me introduce you to, finally, the compression rod release. As we've seen, connects are pretty terrible at holding back weight laterally, but they do hold up well in compression, which is why the compression rod lock can hold back an object so securely, because it's not putting that much strain on the connects itself, or for that matter, the adhesive. And it does all this while remaining very easy to release, again, possible by just knocking a domino off the table. And of course, there are plenty of applications for the compression rod release that have nothing to do with holding back lots of force, like this example from episode three, where I used it to hold back the rotating gear. Number 35, concentrating lever. One of the things that is surprisingly hard to do in a chain reaction machine is press a button. And obviously it's even harder the smaller the button is. One of the classic approaches to pressing a very small button is to have a large object come down and try to hit it with a lot of force. And 
this often doesn't work too well, or at the very least is somewhat unreliable. Another technique that works a little better is what I call the hammer and nail activation, but even this can be a little unreliable and is definitely kind of annoying to build. And the concentrating lever is a mechanism that attempts to address that by taking a large input force and concentrating it into a small target. So what does it look like? Well, it's a second degree lever, meaning that the fulcrum is on one end of the lever as opposed to somewhere in the middle, and the target, the button that you're trying to press, is positioned very close to the fulcrum. And the other end of the lever, opposite from the fulcrum, is where your input force will go. So maybe that's where you'll have a string pull on it, or a cup for a ball to fall into, or something like that. So let's see a concentrating lever in action. Here's how you can use the concentrating lever with a falling domino input or in this case, falling hammer. Here it is with a rolling ball input. And finally, the classic, and probably my favorite, string input. So you can see how successful the concentrating lever is at taking the relatively imprecise force from any of a lot of different inputs, like string or ball or falling domino, and funneling that into a very precise output. And the concentrating lever doesn't even have to be used horizontally. Here's an example of how I used a vertical concentrating lever in the key finder. Number 36, frictional lever. For those of you who aren't familiar with connects, there are three ways to connect a rod and a connector. The first way is to put the rod through the hole of a connector, which results in minimum friction. This is a connection that will rotate without you pushing it. The second way is to attach the mouth of the connector onto the side of the rod. This is a maximum friction connection. It won't rotate even if you do push it. And the third way is to attach the mouth of the connector onto the end of the rod, resulting in a half friction connection, if you will, where it won't rotate by itself, but will rotate if you push it. And this is the type of connection that we're going to take advantage of to make a frictional lever. So here's an example of a trick that uses a frictional lever. You can see the track falls down onto the lever, and then the lever rotates, allowing the track to fall further. And if we replace the frictional lever with a regular lever, we can see that it doesn't even hold itself in the initial position. So what good is that? Basically, we need a lever that has enough friction to hold itself in this initial position, but not so much friction that we can't move it at all. Similarly, this is the same technique that I used in Pool Party Machine for the cereal box dominoes. The lever is able to stay in place initially to catch them as they fall, but is still able to rotate later to allow them to collapse. We've already seen back in episode two how an offset lever can be used to hold back a ball on a track. And if we convert this offset lever into an offset frictional lever, we can see that it works just about the same way. But what the frictional offset lever allows us to do is have a ball roll in and get stopped behind the lever. Of course, to be released again later. But if we try to do this with the regular offset lever, the ball is actually powerful enough to push the lever out of the way making this a much less reliable technique. One problem that the frictional lever is brilliant at solving is holding a lever in an unnatural resting position that is anywhere other than its natural balancing point. Like this lever here has a natural resting point in this position, but we wanna use it as a method of knocking a weight off the table. But the weight just doesn't stay. The weight distribution on the lever is pushing against the weight with too much force. Of course, one thing we could do is add some counterweight to the lever, and this works. And I'll admit this doesn't even look that bad, but I would say in general, I don't normally love the way that counterweights look, and it's definitely not the most elegant solution. The frictional lever, on the other hand, is exactly the solution we're looking for because it's strong enough to hold the lever in this initial position and allow the weight to stay on the table, but it allows the ball to still rotate the lever when it enters the cup. Shifting gears entirely, I've found that one of the most useful applications of the frictional lever is less as a lever, necessarily, and more as a much smoother method of rotating an object. Here we have two rotating tracks that are exactly identical except for one key difference. The track on the left uses the traditional method of making a rotating object, putting the rod through the hole in a connector, or in this case three connectors, while the track on the right uses a frictional connection. The track on the left has much higher tolerances, so it's able to flex laterally to the left and right quite a bit, 
And just in general, it's more susceptible to rotate by itself due to random table vibrations or even the most minor of changes in weight distribution. Meanwhile, the track on the right that uses the frictional connection is a lot more secure. You can see how little it's able to flex from side to side. And when it does rotate, it's a lot smoother. And broadly speaking, I think it looks nicer. So lately, whenever I've needed to make a rotating or tilting object, my first consideration has been, can I use a frictional connection for this? And in a lot of cases, it turns out I can, and I end up being pretty glad that I did. Finally, there's one last thing that I want to mention about the frictional lever. If you remember back in episode two, when we talked about the Kinex release, I showed how you can add a small dot of hot glue to the end of the tan piece to make it stick inside the connector better. Well, that's still a valid solution, but there might be an even better way using a frictional lever. You see, with just a few small adjustments to the base of the lever, we can convert it from a frictionless lever into a frictional lever that stays in place despite vibrations while still being very easy to release. So definitely become familiar with the frictional lever and in general, the frictional connection and get creative and experiment with other applications for it because I'm sure that the frictional lever has much more potential than what I've listed here. Number 37, string stopper lever. A string stopper lever is a lever with a hole at the end for a string to pass through that stays in place until a string stopper on the string pushes it. So here's an example of a situation that you might have. We've got a pulley system here where once the ball enters the cup, it automatically lifts up. And you can see what we're trying to do here is have the cup hit a lever once it gets to a certain height. But the motion of the swinging cup is erratic and unpredictable. And here it just misses the lever altogether. So one thing we might try to do is add some barriers to reduce the swinging. But even that doesn't fully work because it's still easier for the cup to just kind of go around the lever than actually push it up. So the solution here is in redesigning the lever and making it a string stopper lever. And here you can see how the string passes directly through a hole at the end of the lever. Now it doesn't matter how much the cup is swinging and it's impossible for the cup to just go around the lever. One of my favorite examples of the string stopper lever is in this mechanism from Pool Party Machine where we needed a transition out of the frying pan pulley system and the string stopper lever was perfect for the job. Number 38, shifting pusher. A shifting pusher is just like a regular pusher except it snaps into place when an object moves so that when that object returns to its original position again, the pusher is able to push something. So let's build up an example of a situation so that you can get an idea of the circumstances under which you might actually need to use a shifting pusher. So let's start very simple with a rolling platform with a pusher on it that pushes a ball when it gets to its second position. Great, so that's our foundation. Now we're gonna adjust things slightly by temporarily removing the pusher and then changing the weights and the strings so that the platform slides once to the left and then to the right. But because the rolling platform now starts on the right side instead of the left, if we add the pusher back in, there's nowhere to put the ball. What we need is a pusher that will start in some kind of position where it won't interfere with the ball and then snap into a new position when the platform slides to the left and then when it slides back to its original position on the right, it's able to actually push the ball. Sounds complicated, right? Well, it's not the easiest thing in the world to make, but here's an example of a very simple and efficient way that you can accomplish this. With just a small rubber band, I've built a pusher that always wants to snap into a position that points straight towards the ball. So all we have to do is hold it out of position temporarily when the platform is in its initial position, which is what this vertical pillar is for. The shifting pusher is a broad umbrella term, not for this specific mechanism, but for any solution to this specific problem. Basically, it can be any mechanism that solves the problem where you have an object that needs to return to its original position and push something or trigger the next step, but that doesn't interfere when the object, you know, starts in its initial position. For example, here's a totally different technique that I came up with for pushing a marble in Dominoes vs. Machines Round 5. Number 39, one directional lever. A one directional lever is a lever that can push something or hold something or withstand some kind of force when you push it in one direction, but it moves out of the way when you push it from the other direction. We've actually already seen a one directional lever back in this example from episode three when we were talking about the string attractor. You can see that the lever only moves in one direction. When the billiard ball hits it from one side going up the slope, it moves out of the way. But when the billiard ball comes down the slope and hits it from the other side, 
it withstands that force and directs the ball to a side path. Another classic example of an application of the one directional lever is combining it with some kind of repeating motion and using it to grab, so to speak, one ball at a time from a supply once per cycle. So here's an example of what that might look like. We've got a rolling platform here connected to a piston that will continuously oscillate back and forth along these rails. And the one directional lever right here is doing all the work. When the platform slides to the left, the lever moves out of the way, allowing the balls to pass through. But when the platform slides to the right, the lever doesn't move in that direction, so it pushes one of the balls into the track. So let's take a look at another example. At first glance, this trick might seem impossible. Like, the first ball rolls into the tube, but then gets held inside, so the tube must have some kind of bottom to it. But then the second ball just rolls straight through and doesn't stop at all, so where'd the bottom of the tube go? The secret is in the one directional lever, and recognizing that the first ball is pressing on the lever in the direction that it can't move in, while the second ball is pressing on the lever in the direction that it can move. Number 40, flexing parallelogram. A flexing parallelogram is a specific type of structure that's used to keep an object parallel to the table throughout a circular motion. And it's used to keep that object in the same relative position as it moves in this arc. The flexing parallelogram is designed to solve a very specific problem, which is that whenever you have any kind of rotating arm, whatever you put at the end of that arm has to rotate with the arm. So that makes it practically impossible to do any kind of, say, lifting and lowering track because there's no way to permanently keep the track in a position where it can actually function as a track in both positions. So here's that same example, but fixed with the flexing parallelogram. You'll notice that now the track is able to remain parallel in both positions, and for that matter, every other position in between. And because of that property, you can imagine how useful this mechanism is. I've become somewhat notorious for my extensive use of the flexing parallelogram in the past, and I've used it in conjunction with far more than just a track. Like in Domino's vs. Machines round five, there's a trick where I use it to lift a motor. Or in this trick from the Vsauce machine, where a flexing parallelogram keeps a rotating gear level to the table. And finally, the flexing parallelogram is the driving mechanism behind the Jacob's Ladder zigzag boards from 8-Ball Machine. Quite literally, this is a trick that couldn't exist without it. But even that isn't the full scope of what the flexing parallelogram can do because it doesn't have to be a parallelogram. You can adjust the length of various parts of the geometry to result in all kinds of other interesting motions. For example, if you make the top segment a little bit longer, suddenly you've introduced a slight tilt into the rotation. And if you make the bottom segment a little bit longer, you've still got tilt, but now it's in the other direction. And who knows, maybe that motion is useful for a trick that you're making. You can even take a flexing parallelogram and cross the supports to make a flexing cross. And take a look at the motion that results from that. There's definitely a lot of potential there. And don't be afraid to play around and get creative with the flexing parallelogram yourself and make your own adjustments. Like, I'll leave it up to you to figure out what happens when you make one of the supports longer than the other. So, those are the advanced connects techniques. And that's it for episode four. In episode 5, we're going to be looking at weight management, and if the episode's out by now, you can click right here to go watch it. If you liked the video, leave a comment down below telling me what you thought, and if you want to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next episode, you can click right here. I'm Jack of All Spades 98 and I'll see you in the next video.